Good afternoon and welcome to CC Gurukul lecture. In today's lecture, as part of the Indian Sociological Tradition series, I am going to discuss about the contribution of Professor T. K. Uman. Professor T. K. Uman is a pioneering sociologist who has contributed immensely to the growth of sociology in India and to an understanding of Indian society. He is kind of recognized as being one of the earliest Indian sociologists to have studied social movement, which was part of his PhD thesis. So, we begin his understanding by looking into some of the core concepts that he has helped us to understand social movement, nationalism, ethnicity, citizenship and so on. So, let us begin with his understanding of social movement. Professor Uman conceptualized social movement as those purposive collective mobilization informed of an ideology to promote change or stability using any means violent or non-violent and functioning within at least an elementary organizational framework. From this definition we see that what is integral for a social movement is number one collective mobilization, number two an ideology, number three means of doing this collective mobilization and number four an organizational framework. So, that would help us to understand social movement as collective mobilization for the demand for certain resources for accessing certain rights. So, he advocated a comparative analysis with special reference to France, India and Poland because movements were taking parts in other parts of the world as well. To in order to understand how it was taking place in India, it need to be understood how and it was being done in the other parts of the world. He also studied the new wave of social movement. So, you generally when we kind of look into literature and social movement, we have the old social movement which is the peasant movement, the agrarian right, the caste movement and when we look into the new social movement, it takes into account the movements by students, women, anti-nuclear movement and this was kind of a good approach by him because he was transcending beyond traditional class based articulation. Earlier most of the theorization of movements were based around class. Let us look into some of the features of social movement. Number one, he is saying that movements are mechanism through which men attempt to move from periphery of system to its center. So, most of the time a movement is initiated by those who are at the bottom of the uh, hierarchy and th they have been facing exploitation appropriation and therefore, the objective is to move from the periphery to the center. Second, Movements are conscious efforts on the part to mitigate the deprivation and secure social justice. So, movements are conditioned by social structural factors. It implies voluntary action. So, it is people who create movements to achieve goals they want. Third, movements are perhaps the chief mechanism through which deprived category demonstrate their power. So, in order to understand his contribution, let us look into his advice for the study of social movement. And here we take a quote from the book published in 1977, an adequate framework for the study of social movement should take into account the historicity, the elements of present social structure and the future vision of the society in which they originate and operate. So, from the past traverse through the current social structure and be able to understand or predict the future in with towards which the movement is oriented. So, a social movement, a study of the social movement would include all three past, present and a future. Professor Uman states that all social movement center around three factors. 
number 1 locality number 2 issues and number 3 social categories place problem and the people so locality refers to the place where the movement initiate issue is the problem that the people is facing and social category it could be say dalit it could be the lower caste it could be women so or in category those who are the victims of certain kind of inequality so the goal of the social movement is to ensure that they are able to achieve social justice Professor Oman describes three approaches to the study of social movement, historical, psychological and sociological. The historical approach focuses on the career of movement and characteristics of participants and the motivation. So the historical would obviously traverse to the past understand the problem that was faced by the particular category of people and the factors that led to the emergence of the movement. Psychological approach perceives movement as expression of the needs and discontent of participants. So, the, uh, there has to be a level, a psychological level, uh, emotional imbalance whereby the inequality or the inability to kind of acquire certain rights, certain privilege would kind of become so strong that then this category of people are moved towards doing a collective mobilization. And the third approach is sociological analysis of social movement. Now this implies that the movement is taking place within a society. So basically as we have seen from the characteristics of movement, it involves a number of people, categories of people who have been affected by certain problems. So therefore, a sociologist would look into the embeddedness of the uh, uh, movement that is arising, the relationship between the people as victim and victimizers, the uh, genesis of the problem, the objective the, uh, and the way in which the objectives are met. He points out at the limitation of the structural functional paradigm. Structural functional paradigm is an important perspective in sociology which tries to look into the structures of the society and the functions that it kind of contributes. Most of the time the structural functional paradigm advocates the maintenance of a status quo. So he is critical of the approach in the analysis of social movement as it stresses an order and integration rather than on conflict and change. So when a movement is taking place, the focus cannot be on order because there was a disorder that led to the movement. So it has to be analyzed from the perspective of conflict and transformation. He traces the historical evolution of theories of social movement from the classical thinkers Durkheim, Weber and Marx. Now, though these thinkers, if we look into the work of Durkheim, Weber and Marx, they are nowhere directly talking about social movement as such. But the sociology is premised on collective action. So, they were focusing on collectivity in the analysis of society. So, Durkheim in the study of division of labor in society published in 1893 and later elementary forms of religious life. Both these texts has been discussed in lectures in the series called key text in sociology. But when we look at the theory of Durkheim, we see that he was kind of in favor of a theory of collective action. So, and he is kind of talking about the collective consciousness of the people, the totem being representing the identity of the uh, 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 group and therefore the collectivity society as God. And in the late, in the division of labor, he is talking about uh, solidarity produced and approved forms of collective action from uh, mechanical solidarity to organic solidarity. When we look into the work of Weber, 
Weber is looking into the theory of social change with the notion of reutilization of charisma, where the two opposing force of disruptions are the authority of rationality and the power of charisma. Similarly, Karl Marx described social change as more systematic because he was looking into collective actions of antagonistic classes. In his theory of class, he kind of talks about the conflict between the capitalist and the working class. Women is kind of being more impressed by Marxian analysis of social class, uh, movement because it is talking about collective deprivation. Next, we look into the classification of social movement. Here, Professor Uman has used two criteria for classification of social movement. One, type of collectivities, biological, primordial and civil. And number two, nature of goals, the where, what was the nature of the goal of the movement. It could either be symbolic or it could be instrumental. So, when we look into the classification, he traverses through a phase wise development of social movement in 20th century. So, he begins with the three phases through which social movement in India has evolved. The colonial phase which is 1900 to 1947, the nation building phase 1947 to 89 and the present phase of globalizing India which is 1990 to the present. When we traverse through these three phases, we see that the nature, the goal and objective of social movements has undergone change. Types of social movement, he differentiates between ideological, organizational and charismatic. Ideological would be movements which are centered around certain ideology, organizational in terms of having its original within an organizational framework in order to achieve certain goals of the organization and charismatic which is kind of coming in from Weberian understanding. According to Professor Uman, social movements in society are conditioned by three factors. Number one, its core institutional order. Number two, the principal enemy as perceived by the deprived. So, it always have two categories, the victim and the victimizer or the one who has been, who are the creating this deprivation and the other category which is being deprived. And the third factor is the primary goal pursued by the society. So, the nature and types of social movement keep changing as these features change. So, the institutional order will change, the one who is creating deprivation or the category which is being deprived will undergo change, goals and objective of the organizations will change and therefore, there are different categories of social movements that have been part of India. Let us focus on identity movement because it is very significant in contemporary India. According to Professor Uman, identity movement focuses on social movement with special reference to religion, caste, tribe and language. When we look into these categories, we see each one of it is a category of collective identity and the movements are around this collective identity. He makes distinction between two types of identity movement, hegemonic and emancipatory. The agenda of hegemonic identity movement is to maintain the status quo and perpetuate its dominance. Whereas, Emancipatory movement constructs identity to assert justice, equality, dignity and rights. So, if we look into the Dalit movement, it is part of the emancipatory movement as it is a question of asserting justice and equality. In the process of social transformation, the large scale transformation, social change due to change in the political, uh, constitutional provisions, program, policy, economic change, political change, we see some of the identities are rejected or becomes obsolete, some are reinvented and still others are newly created. 
Now, when we look into the understanding of identity and social transformation, Professor Omen kind of argues that it is more realistic to arrange identity in a rigid flexibility continuum. So, the, it you cannot kind of consider it as primordial or constructed. It is not out there, it is undergoing change and there is a con continuous flow from one end to the other. He regarded gender and race identity as rigid, whereas identities based on religion, caste or language are flexible. Now, why are these uh, flexible? Because one can change. One could change the caste through the process of Sanskritization or you could give up your language, acquire a new language. So, these are kind of considered as flexible and those based on class and citizenship are substantially fluid. Next, he, let us look into his understanding of nationalism, ethnicity and citizenship. According to Professor Uman, nationalism, ethnicity and citizenship have been kind of most of the time been confused. They are kind of considered to be imminently related to each other. So, when we talk about ethnicity, it talks about race. When we talk about citizenship, it is about class and nationalism about nation and nation state. His basic argument is that in some primordial beginning, Peoplehood was based on coincidence of territory and language. People who sustained that connection constituted nations. Ethnicity arised when the link between culture and territory is broken, for example, by migration. Nationals are insiders, ethnics are outsiders. Neither ethnicity nor nationality has any conceptual connections to state within which membership is purely a matter of citizenship. Citizenship has the potential to create an arena of equality within which competing claims rooted in national and ethnic differences may be reconciled. He also talks about when he is talking about ethnicity, a process of ethnification. He defines it as a process of some collectives as outsiders and thereby making their cultural differences salient for political and economic discrimination. So, he is kind of discussing in detail the relationship between insider and outsider. It is complex in terms of who is the insider and outsider and much of ethnicity can be understood by attributing the cat identity of outsider to people of certain race. Professor Uman identifies six reasons for the process of ethnification. Number one, a nation may continue to be in its ancestral or adopted homeland and yet it may be ethnified by colonizing or native dominant collectivity, for example, the Bodo mobilization. Number two, the denial of full-fledged participation in the economy and polity to an immigrant collectivity which had adopted a new land as its homeland. The example is ethnification of the tea tribes of Assam. Third, the tendency on the part of a settler collectivity to identify with its ancestral home despite a lot of time being spent after decades and a lot of changes having taken, yet one tends to consider the, it as their homeland. Fourth, ethnification also occurs when a state attempts to integrate and homogenize different nation in its territory into a common people. So, there is a tendency to kind of bring together people of different race, people of different ethnic background in the objective of creating a nation state, which for many would be difficult in terms of identifying one with this. If the fifth, those migrant to an alien lands are denied basic human and citizenship right, even when they become eligible for them. They are ethnified in that 
they are treated as strangers and outsider. So, they be, take the citizenship, they become part of the state, they kind of become, uh, they fulfill all the criteria of a true citizen, but yet the idea of discrimination continues with the labeling of outsider. The sixth, even when immigrants are accepted as co-national by the host society, the former may not want that identity and might wish to return to their homeland. So, there is always a psychological urge to go back to your uh, homeland and that can create the process of ethnification. So, after understanding ethnicity, let us understand the concept of citizenship. According to Professor Women, the idea of citizenship is based on two misconceptions. Number one, that it comes from part of the world from Europe. That is based on a misconception because wherever state existed, there was always citizenship. And number two misconception is the idea of stateless society. This is a conceptual nullity because no society ever existed without a state. Now, the understanding of state is subjective, how it is defined. If state is understood as a body, the entity which is endowed with rights to exercise legitimate authority, that every society, the so-called primitive society also had state. So, this there is no idea of a stateless society. The term citizenship is a notion, according to Professor Oman, which is associated with a democratic state and is evolved through different stages. During the pre-colonial time, with the rule kings and emperors, there were no citizen but they were subject. So, it is saying that when pre-colonial time we do not have the idea of a state or a nation, the rulers, the king, the emperors, they were on the dominance and all the people of that particular kingdom were the subject. Every emperor had his subjects. Then we come to the colonial regime. Now, during the colonial regime, we have the dominance of the Britishers and they, all the Indians became the subject of the Britishers. The idea of citizenship as it is prevailing in the contemporary world is in fact a post-colonial concept. There was a tendency in earlier times that many things are combined. Now, there is a tendency to differentiate the idea of fairness and justice before the king, emperor and the state was the basic idea of citizenship. The state is expected to treat citizen equally if other conditions are same. Citizenship is related to the institution of nationship, nation state, but nation state itself is a problematic notion. In the idea of nationship, nation or people and nation state, we see an effort at merging the two. So, you have two concepts, the nation and the state and the two have been combined to create the concept of nation state. And Professor Oman gives an appeal to consider the two, that is nation and state as separate and offer the possibility of a liberating theory of state formation that rested in accommodation rather than triumphalism. There is no such thing as nation state. By showing that even such seeming candidates as Great Britain, France and Germany have not achieved perfect coincidence of nation and state. Professor Uman is particularly wary of the danger of what he describes as project homogenization. The loss of identity by minority at the hands of nation state, a common outcome once the nation and the state are linked as they were in some cases in Western Europe. In these situations of state-led nationalism, the state grants individual equality of citizenship in compensation for the loss of minority identities. On the other hand, in South Asia, Professor Uman argues both individual equality and group identity coexist. 
So, with this whole understanding of his uh, idea of social movement, ethnicity, citizenship and nation state, we are able to understand Professor Woman's contribution to political sociology. And for reference, here are some of the original work by Professor T.K. Woman. Number one is the book published in 1997, Citizenship, Nationality and Ethnicity, Reconciling Competing Identity. Number two, published in 2002, Pluralism, Equality and Identity, Comparative Study. Number three, published in 2004, Development Discourse, Issues and Concern. And next, also published in 2004, Nation, Civil Society and Social Movement. If you read this book, you will get a good idea of this political sociology of Professor T.K. Uman. With this, I come to an end of today's lecture. Thank you.